Thanks, Kelly. It's a great uh, honor for me to be able to uh, follow uh, Governor Dukakis. Um, he was my first boss and supervisor uh, when I moved to Boston, fresh out of law school and architecture school. Uh, he uh, brought together a round table of uh, uh, emerging lawyers uh, at Hill and Barlow where uh, Bill Weld had the office across the hall for me and several other people went on to become uh, federal judges and uh, other kinds of leaders within the community. And I think uh, the key uh, to what I learned from him is that uh, not only is there life after legal practice, but that in fact uh, one acquires a set of skills that are useful in terms of uh, shaping public policy. Uh, in a variety of ways, and that's what I've had opportunities to do over the years. I would also just note quickly that uh, thanks to Mike and to Fred Salvucci, um, I was the first uh, person of color to be appointed to the board of the MBTA back in the day uh, when we were expanding the system uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, the region. And so uh, I've learned a lot from him, um, and I'm grateful to uh, him for his mentorship. We love Boston. Uh, Boston is a, a city that uh, in scale may only be one quarter the size of Brooklyn, uh, both in terms of geography and in terms of population. But Boston has a kind of charm uh, that attracts people from all over the world. Europeans say that uh, Boston is uh, the favorite city that they would uh, prefer to visit. Uh, whether it's on Beacon Hill or in the Back Bay or uh, visiting our neighborhoods and looking at triple deckers uh, in uh, Charlestown or uh, in uh, Dorchester. But the city that Boston was in the 19th century, the city that uh, is so charming, uh, was a city that was built where work patterns and play patterns and living patterns and demographic patterns are very different than they are today. And so uh, we are uh, called upon, really, challenged to think about uh, different ways of being more innovative about the design of the city. And traditionally, what innovation has meant uh, has been the design of signature buildings for wealthy or uh, public clients, uh, uh, the uh, uh, facilities that uh, come about because of the Olympics or because some telecommunications company or uh, some group of condominium owners have the resources to build a very fancy a signature sculptures in the landscape. Uh, and we have gotten, to use, gotten used to thinking of innovation as something that really involves some big, fancy, new building. But the fact of the matter is that innovation in cities goes far beyond the creation of a signature building. And in fact, we need to think very differently about what innovation is, particularly in a city the size and scale of Boston. And I would submit that uh, we need to think innovatively about issues of sustainability and resilience. We need to think innovatively about different ways of using new building materials and new ways of measuring whether a building really works. We need to think differently about smart growth and regionalization. We need to think differently about how we use big data as a tool for generating design. We need to think about the fact that we are a city that is on the waterfront, and yet we have people in many of our neighborhoods and many of our cities who have never been down to the waterfront. They have never been to a harbor island. They have never experienced the fact that Boston is, in fact, a waterfront city, and that you can be in downtown and sometimes not be able to find the water. We need to think differently about that. We need to think differently about who now lives in the city, the demographic diversity of the city, the fact that Boston is now a city that is euphemistically known as a majority-minority city, one that is far more diverse than one experiences when one walks along the waterfront today and doesn't see families with small children, doesn't see the ethnic diversity in the city. We need to think about design as it enhances economic equity across the city, as it makes possible 
uh, the ability to move around and to get to work differently. And we need to think about Boston as a city that really is positioned as an East Coast port of entry, as a real global city. And what that means when you have a subway system that shuts down at one o'clock in the morning and you can't find a Starbucks or a restaurant that's open at 1.30 or 2 in the morning when you would want to be interacting with people elsewhere in the world. So when we think about design and innovative design in Boston, we have to think in a transcendent way about what is being built, how it's being built, and most importantly, how it works. I would point to three things that help determine that. One is placemaking. What we've come to understand about cities is that what we take away from a city, what we remember about the city, is the experience of places in that city. Not individual buildings, but in fact how buildings operate with each other in a context that creates wonderful spaces. And we all have been in spaces in New York or Paris or Rome, and it's the space rather than the individual building that generates a sense of experience there. Here's an example of placemaking in Los Angeles at the entry uh, to the airport. Here are some other examples of ways that placemaking through uh, the strategic placement of objects or art helps to generate a sense of where you are. And that sense of where you are can be both compressed around a piece of art, or it can be open in a way that creates a sense of a shared community. We know places because we think of them as spaces that generate positive experiences for us and where we know where we are at any given moment. All of these are places some here in the greater Boston area and some abroad, that are created because of the dynamic that is generated because buildings speak to each other and draw us into those places. What does draw us in? Well, it helps to know where you are. And in Boston, we confuse ourselves all the time in terms of how one gets from point A to B in downtown, how one gets from downtown to Dorchester or Roslindale. Boston is a much more confusing city than it needs to be given the size and scale of the city it is. And that's a result of a lack of consistent and coherent wayfinding. Wayfinding gives us a place. It lets us know where we are at any given moment and how we might get to the next place. And these are all examples of train stations, which normally mark places in Philadelphia, in New York, in Los Angeles, in other great American cities. We need to think about how we get around. The third key thing is the use of technology. And technology today has totally transformed the way we interact with and experience cities. Five years ago, if we were to discuss how one goes about accessing hotels or transportation, we would not have thought to factor into our thinking the role of Airbnb, which is now the largest hospitality company in the world, or Uber, which has now taken over informal transportation. Both of those are technologically based interfaces with how we experience the city. And so we need to think very differently about the use of our smart devices and how they enable us to not only create a sense of community but a sense of place. We need to think about how we can interact using technology with our geography so that we can find our way around. We need to think about how we share information and create communities that are both literal in the sense of bringing us together in a physical space, but also virtual 
to the extent that they bring us together in spaces that we can share, but which aren't always traditional physical spaces. We need to remember that innovation in Boston is not necessarily a new thing. That in fact, there has been innovation that has taken place in Boston for generations, decades, and indeed centuries. And that many of the most memorable spaces in Boston, such as here at the Christian Science Church, here in City Hall Plaza, here in housing in Cambridge, here likewise in Cambridge housing. All of these were innovative structures at the time they were built. The bowling, bowling building in Roxbury is an innovative structure today, which is wish, winning national and international awards because it brings together sustainability and historic preservation in one place in the new headquarters for the Boston Public Schools. And sustainability also takes place in our neighborhoods in this innovative and very sustainable housing development which is being built, has been built uh, here in Boston. We need to remember that once Commonwealth Avenue itself was viewed as an innovative development and that the housing in the Back Bay and in the South End, when they were developed, were innovative spaces, some of which were challenged at the time by other people who asked, why do we need this now? The last point I would make about innovation in design relates to who our designers are. We have changed as a design profession only marginally in the last century. The number of women and people of color who are now designers is not significantly different than it was a quarter century ago. And if we're going to think about innovative design, we need to think about who our designers are and how we diversify the group of individuals who are doing design for very different kinds of people. I remind students in design school all the time that the ultimate client that they may be working with might be their grandmother who's not as tall as they are and may not be able to reach those shelves or might be someone from a different culture who has a different way of thinking about and using public spaces. And the only way we will challenge ourselves to think differently about design is to challenge ourselves to think differently about who our designers are. And that may ultimately be the most innovative thing that we can do to change design in Boston. Thank you very much. <laughs>